with one more tonight for PitchCon. It is an episode of Dugout Study Hall. And hey, if you actually follow them on Twitter, you might have seen that there might be a bingo card uh, for tonight's episode, which is incredibly exciting. Matt Goodwin, Alexander Chase. Great to see both of you. I cannot believe I'm actually welcoming you on, Chase, after you just publicly said, like, CSW, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to go hate on it for the next hour. But, Nick, please mm. have me on. No, I think it's important what you're going to do because, obviously, CSW isn't a holy grail stat. There are always flaws with everything, and I'm excited for you to pinpoint exactly what is good and what is bad about it. But before you do, I have to shout out two people, Ben and BEF, both – a contributing $25. Ben says, Barry play Despa Zito, which I think is pretty amazing. Barry Zito, amazing curveball. And BEF says, happy to help. And so nice to see many of my friends involved. I could not agree more, BEF. Thank you both so much for your contributions. We're close to $6,300 raised, which is amazing. And we're going to have to rally a little bit to be, you know, to catch up our pace for tomorrow's goal of 10000 by the end. I believe in this community. I believe in what you guys are going to do to help. I uh, can get those contributions. Of course, we're raising money for Feeding America. So go to pitchos.com slash pitch make your contribution today. And I'm going to let you guys have the floor. I'm excited to watch an episode of Dugout Study Hall. All right. Welcome, everybody. I, uh, I'm Matt Goodwin, the host, and we're going to ramp up here in a second with our regular intro. Uh, as Nick hinted at, we have a, uh, an interesting and exciting episode for you. Alexander, you want to say anything before we, uh, we hit our official intro? Um, just that like I have seen the big the uh, bingo card that you made, but that I am doing my best to ignore every part of it because I know that most of it's teasing the things that I'm inevitably going to do accidentally. So <laughs> I'm not doing anything on purpose. Nobody has paid me for a specific line. There's going to be no Pete Rose shenanigans here. And to be fair, it's very possible that there's an easier line somewhere, and that would be on me. But it's all for a good cause. If you have not already donated. Before we go ahead and get started, please do that. The free space in the center of the bingo card, by the way, is um, a $15 donation. And whoever is the winner, uh, we all the winners, are, we're going to go into a, a – you can email uh, at uh, at gmail.com. We'll pick one at random, and I will be making a $25 donation in your name. So that is what we're going to be doing. Uh, Nick, I think, popped the uh, link to the bingo card there in the chat. So if you have not seen it, you can find it. Uh, through my Twitter at the Corked Matt, you can find it uh, uh, at Dugout Study Hall, and I think that link. So, Alexander, buckle up. Here we go. All Welcome right, I guess Study Hall, a remedial course in baseball stats, and proud member of the Pitcher List Podcast Network. I'm your host and expert layman Matt Goodwin, and I am joined, as always, by your fake baseball economist Alexander Chase. On this live episode, we will be talking a whole lot about CSW and apparently Kevin Gossman's slider. We will be also playing a dugout study hall bingo game for the very first time. And of course, we're going to have to chat just a little bit about the weather. But before we get to all of that, Alexander, how you doing? You know, uh, pretty good. I'll, I'll tell uh, I uh, made some changes to my setup for the day, which are really weird, including accidentally putting like half my monitor on the screen. So we're going to see how much is like giving away go. as we go. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> if you look really Excited. carefully, you might see what's coming next. Uh, so to, uh, to make sure that we do what the people expect of us, we need to talk about this snowstorm that's coming. Has it already started where you are? We got like a couple hours of like fake snow and I think it's going to miss us now. Uh, a great mm. thing is that it did shut down my office, which meant that I got to stay home for the day and like <laughs> be prepared for this. Uh, I didn't have to like commute an hour home to like barely miss the beginning of this or anything. So great day for me. And yet I'm having monitor is still time. in view. You had all day to get it right, and you can still see the monitor. <laughs> no excuses. No yeah, excuses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I won't make any. Uh, we're, I think we're going to get pretty hit up here in Connecticut. So I'm anticipating like 8, 10, 12, 14 inches of snow. Who knows? Enough snow that I'm going to have to go out and deal with it tomorrow. But uh, um, I think that we're going to be okay. I think we're going we're gonna to survive it. Uh, so maybe a small introduction here for people who have not uh, listened to the podcast before. And if you haven't, please do check us out. Uh, you can find us again on Twitter at Dugout Study Hall. Um, we have been doing Dugout Study Hall now, Alexander, for about a year, right? We started about a year ago when the podcast network launched ish, right? This is Yeah, we were we were there at that time. 
And we were, <laughs> we were in the vicinity somewhere. Uh, this is uh, going to be episode 45. So, um, you know, this is, this is a really cool thing uh, that we get to do. And we'll be going weekly again very, very soon. And uh, please, if you have not been a, uh, a listener or a follower, if you haven't given us a, a rating or a review, uh, it always helps a lot for, for those things. For people to find us, hopefully you enjoy what we're about to do here. Um, so, uh, I just want to remind everybody that we do have the bingo card at the bottom. This is the deal. Just a reiteration. Uh, if you're listening to this live, obviously, if you're listening to this, uh, when it releases on the feed, this is already over. Uh, but, uh, anybody who gets a bingo on that card, you can email, uh, me, I'll, I'll be checking that the, uh, the email address, uh, dugout study hall at gmail.com. And from the people who get a bingo, we will select a winner, and I will be making a $25 donation to PitchCon in your name. It's all going for a good cause. So uh, have some fun, and uh, maybe we'll see some things pop up in that chat that uh, that might be relevant. And and honestly, have fun with it. If you see something, point it out. Let everybody win. That's, that's, that's what we're here for. We want uh, everybody to have a good time. So, Alexander, it is time to get started. Let's talk about our segment, Numbers of the Week. Um, you want to talk a little bit about Gossman's slider. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the pitch everyone like expects us to talk about with him, right? Um, this weird thing happened earlier this week. I was like kind of just digging through some pitch level data because I don't typically like looking at pitch level data. Uh, and I was kind of like curious about a few different things and it popped for a couple different reasons, one of which we'll get to later and is like actually the point. But there were also some really funny things that happened for it. Yeah. So I'm going to kind of like throw a, a half-hearted question back at you. Like, uh, you know, Kevin Gossman doesn't really rely on a slider, I imagine, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, so. I... I I, I, I'm, I get jokes. Uh, also, I apologize to all the listeners out there. And thank you, Alexander. We don't have to keep this private. Uh, I had the wrong input mic on. So thank you for pointing that out. That is what a good podcast co-host does for you. Hopefully this sounds a lot better. I apologize. You sound healthier right now somehow. I, it's great. I, I, that's what we're going for here. So my apologies to everybody. That's Matt making a mistake. Check your bingo card. That might be on there. I mean, it might be there. It's possible. So anyway, back to uh, to what you want to talk about in terms of of this number of the week, thirty five point eight percent CSW on Kevin Gossman's slider. Yeah, that was one of the numbers that popped for me. Like um, if we're like trying to hunt around for guys like him who like have two pitches, I, I feel like an exercise that a lot of other people probably are going to be doing is hunting around for any different sign that so-and-so moving to so-and-so different team can try out something different and get better. Gossman was really good with just two pitches, but like that's not st something that typically works for most people. Uh, so I, I thought he was really interesting. Now, I, I kind of fished around because I'm going to like really set up this fantastically awful straw man if I don't. But like <laughs> as far as I can tell, I haven't caught anyone saying that like Kevin Gossman's going to be even better next year with the Blue Jays because, you know, they're going to take his already really awesome secret weapon slider and turn into something good. So I want to talk about like the good parts of it really quickly. We can kind of like talk about how this fits into how we would like normally go after this before we can talk about like why it's really weird in this one weird way. Uh, so, okay. you know, like the standard stuff, you know, it's got a 15.3% swinging strike rate. Uh, if those of you guys are familiar with like Nick's money pitch idea, 15% is roughly the bar. Uh, so, that's not so bad. I actually went and looked. I was curious. It uh, looks like the league average for a slider is 17% for a swinging strike rate, but still, like, pretty close. It's not so bad. Um, has a 42.4% <laughs> whiff rate, though, which is really exceptional. Only, like, 33% is roughly average. Uh, if you're, if you want to think about that in terms of batters, you know, like, someone who's pretty good at getting on base and is, like, not just really awful is going to have a contact rate in general, like a whiff rate as a batter, somewhere close to 80 maybe a little bit less than that, your Joey Gallows of the world are going to be down around 70. So if you have a pitch that can make people worse than Joey Gallo at making contact, that's usually pretty good. So that was really interesting. <laughs> to me. Um, he also has a 44.3% zone rate, uh, which 40% for money pitch. Uh, I also found league average for a slider is about 44, but these are like the sort of numbers you want to check to make sure that something really weird isn't happening. 
So he's clearing like the, the couple of checks, even without them like, popping is super exceptional. Um, now the really interesting thing though, is he's got a 20.5% called strike rate on this pitch. And I thought that was crazy. Like, you don't typically see pitches get that many called strikes. Uh, and then, you know, like, a lot of the other stuff that you would kind of normally look for uh, look pretty good. It's like, they had an 87 WRC plus again, so that a positive p They didn't use it very much, just 6% of the time, so that's still pretty good. Um, but, like, on the bad side, I don't really know how I care about BABIP on a small usage pitch, 0.333 BABIP, but it all had just a 20.5% <laughs> chase rate. So, it's getting a ton of called strikes. No one's ever swinging at this thing. And, you know, we're looking for a 40% um, chase rate, roughly, for, like, a, a money pitch, I believe. Maybe I have that number wrong. 32% is roughly the league average for a slider. So, like, people are not swinging at this thing at all. Uh, uh, me, yeah, and, I want to jump in for just a second because I want to yes. clarify one thing just in case uh, uh, people are curious. Um, and, you know, this is like what I do, right? I interrupt your tra tra train of thought and ask you questions because sometimes I don't get things. So um, when we're talking about a, a, a called strike rate, is that a discrete skill? Is that something somebody can be good at? Or is that more like when we talked about Robbie Ray's left on base percentage in an earlier episode? Yeah, that that is actually something that we that we kind of do need to talk about today long term I, i'm going to say for the sake of this though it's not no like that's not it's a not full no. accident thing uh yeah so like okay. there's actually a really way to be clear to about that yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a, a great piece that came up uh today on fan graphs uh by justin Choi about um the this isn't fully called strike rate but similar concept if you want to kind of walk with me here uh about uh, julia arias's uh like ability to hide the ball and like how that mm -hmm. interferes with batter's ability to pick up what he's doing and you know like actually get good contact with the pitch we found that there are a lot of uh pitchers who through different things a lot of sinkers actually that like behave really weirdly and you know just other placement get people to not swing um and that does seem like a, dis a discrete skill you can also probably look at some different guys uh, a guy who really uh, stood out for me when i was like looking around at some stuff today because i just spent a bunch of time uh, <laughs> screwing around on fan graphs today well i i after i found something it is that um like a handful of guys do really seem like they lean a lot on called strikes but most people don't so like sunny gray is one of the few pitchers in the league who has a called strike strikeout rate it's like if you take the strikeout rate and you split it up into like swinging strikes and like looking mm -hmm. strikes he gets more than 10 percent of his batters to, to strike out looking he's like one of the only pitchers who does it um nick if you're still listening and i hope you are i know you don't <laughs> believe in sunny gray i think i figured out why <laughs> it's because he doesn't like visually pop in the sort of believable ways and uh and actually one of the things that, that kind of brought up to me is like since he traded their catcher so you might think to yourself maybe called strike stuff uh might have something to do with like your catcher ability so nick if you clearly are listening to me if sunny yeah. gray is not traded from the reds i think i'm going to be more out on him because he's not going to have gold glove catching to like but you refuse to give nick credit for that uh <laughs> no i will not give him credit for that i get the point though actually as, as i kind of look more into it today it really really um made sense to me how some of the holistic approach that you know i listed off just a bunch of numbers about a random pitch right. and as someone who started listening to a bunch of fantasy podcasts a few years ago kind of just like immediately jumping into like some of the things where people were like really excited to tell you about all their favorite dudes without really stopping to figure out what's going on with a lot <laughs> of my favorite dudes that i suddenly had out of nowhere you know this sort of feeling of just here's a bunch of numbers go do with something with it was really overwhelming to me um and i just read a lot of numbers kind of on purpose so i kind of want to throw to you like i said a bunch of those things what are you kind of be by default looking for to, to get a grasp on if something is good or not? Like, what are you feel like you're going to try to trust? Well, I mean, I, as we have well established on this podcast, I am not the numbers guy amongst the two of us. Um, I think some of your number sense has rubbed off on me a little bit, which is fantastic. Another, another positive quality in a, um, in a, a podcast co-host. Yeah. Thank you for getting inception off of your screen there. That was messing with my brain. I could not follow a train of thought. Um, 
you know, uh, historically, I've always been a little bit more of like the eye test. So, you know, uh, one of the things about getting into this industry that's been really interesting for me is seeing how the eye test and the numbers uh, can support one another and how you can look. Because sometimes, listen, and we've talked about this too. Sometimes numbers are just numbers and in, in, in like they're not necessarily going to be repeated or they're not going to be uh, consistent or we're talking about small sample sizes. So when you can see the eye test and you can see that pitch looks great and the numbers back up that it actually is effective, that's that's kind of the thing that really um, that, that I like to look for. Um, but I, I mean, I again, I I'm not the numbers guy. So you're way better at being able to read the tea leaves when it comes to that. You know, but at the same time, I asked that question because like the reality is that numbers get fed to people all the time. And, and if you're right. standing in, it, not as I'm going to call, not going to call you a full layman at this point or anything like that, but <laughs> you know, everyone does kind of have like what they sort of know that other people have told them they're supposed to trust for the most part. And right. I do think that the reason I led with CSW is because in the past couple of years, it's kind of taken up an increasingly high, like, spot on our like list of things we're going to list off for a pitch or for a pitcher or whatever it is to determine whether or not it's good so if i say that for example this pitch has a 35.8 percent csw and you don't go digging into like the behind the curtain nonsense that i'm going to reveal i promise (laughs) like this pitch sounds good right i'm not crazy to say like i've kind of given most of the normal things you'd give for a pitch and it sounds like it should be pretty good in my opinion and like I, I definitely yeah. fooled myself for a second. I'm not trying to call anyone <laughs> out here dumb for doing these sorts of things because like it's really hard to know which bowl you need to whack <laughs> to like well, exactly. actually get the answer. And part of what I was getting at, I guess, uh, in terms of, of numbers is that there are certain numbers that I think you can use to make whatever argument you already want to make. So you kind of um, have this uh, like bias towards what you want the answer to be. And then the numbers that kind of support that jump out at you or, um, you know, and and as we've talked about before, too, we talked about it with uh, Justin Mason on the episode that actually came out this morning is, you know, places uh, that have things like the sliders, right? For people who are not processing all of these information, all of these pieces of information and and necessarily understanding everything, um, you you might find people relying on numbers and they may not know exactly what goes into that number or how that stat is calculated. And so, um, you know, having having more than just like the the list of of numbers, I think, is really important. And, and you know, obviously, that's what we kind of talk about a lot when we go back and forth here. And just want to shout out Ben Brown there. Thank you for playing and participating. Uh, I don't know if you actually have bingo or if you're just trying to contribute to our conversation because maybe he has something to do with one of the squares on the bingo, but thank you. Thank you very much. And in, in that same vein, I am kicking myself for not putting Alexander Chase says Chase rate on the card. Should have done it. Didn't I, do it. I planned it out on purpose today to actually make <laughs> sure I could say it as well. <laughs> I, yeah. So anyway, back on track. I apologize for the uh, the aside there. Yeah, I feel like it's probably worth a while before we dig into like the which numbers we should be using for which reason later on to kind of like just give like a here's why I picked a few of these and why I would leave these off. I'm trying to make sure. the mostly convincing case for this one. So uh, swinging strike rate versus whiff rate is a thing I've seen us move towards in my own brief time. Like uh, it matters more that you can get swinging strikes which are the same thing as whiffs that's really annoying but whatever um in in total not just based off of the if the batter decided to swing um because you can't induce swings very often um your pitch isn't going to be doing a very good job you know imagine like the hypothetical like drops a hundred inches curveball but you know it always lands two feet in front of the plate it's nasty <laughs> it's moving a whole lot i'm sure um but like no one's swinging at it if you can't control your wild stuff, if you like imagine at Jordan Hicks blindfolded, um, like, <laughs> like no as gonna, I often no do, no one's going to swing either. <laughs> uh, so like we prefer swinging strike rate for those sorts of like fairness reasons, just because someone can get a lot of whiffs relative to swings, but can't get any swings. You want to be able to compare that fairly against someone who's like generating a whole lot of swings, 
and, and as a result, getting a fair number of whiffs. Getting getting a fair comparison is kind of like the point there. So that's why I led with that. Now the whiff number for Gossman Slider being ten points ish above average is intriguing, and that would be something where often you would see people say something like, "Let's try to use it differently." You know, can we through better game planning or something like that get more people to actually swing at the thing? I mean, you know, maybe it's like better, better like a disguising, maybe not tipping your pitches uh, as often. Uh, so zone rate is important, obviously, for some similar sort of reasons. You actually have to throw it in the zone for people to want to swing at it because pitches out of the zone are hard to hit. Um, also, they get called strikes, which is the reason that actually I led down to right, talking right. about called strike thing, right, for this thing. Uh, there are a couple of numbers I typically exclude when I'm talking about pitch level stuff. Most of them are going to be things like uh, like the outcomes on a pitch. And that's kind of like a weird take, I think. That I kind of want to talk about like I didn't bring up like the batting average this thing had against it or like the right the woba and, and there's a reason for that some pitches are used to like get you to the late parts of the count some pitches are used to get you through like the parts of the count where you're behind and so like they're not going to get the benefit of strikeouts right um some pitches are going to be your strikeout pitch so they're going to get all those strikeouts and their woba is going to look really good because they're not the ones that can be put into play for singles as often so like mm -hmm. you can't fairly compare within one pitcher's arsenal like the woba on one pitch to the woba on another now you can probably fairly compare like gossman's four seam to someone else's four seam you can fairly compare his splitter to some other splitters in the league. It is really good. It's not hard to make a case for his splitter being really good. But like, I don't want to make someone who isn't ready to make those adjustments on the fly do all that work. And that's, I think, like that statement right there is really what we want to get at today in terms <laughs> of like where we get at the problem that I've kind of unpacked with CSW right down, down the road. So... The case on Gossman Slider, all that good stuff, all that good stuff, except for the, you know, it seems like nobody swings at it. So I want you, I would love for you, actually, a fun thing we can do today, because we have a chat, mm. is I would love to see if that anyone could actually uh, try to guess why it is that Kevin Gossman's uh, slider doesn't get anyone to swing at it. Give yeah, I, I would definitely say anybody who's listening, you've got a better shot at getting this right than I do because I always get his trivia wrong. So uh, please feel free to put your answers in. Why don't you repeat the question for those uh, those people who are listening and see if they can maybe come up with some good answers. Yeah, so yeah, again, the, the basic situation was most of the numbers look really good. This, there's a huge called strike rate. Uh, there's a pretty average swinging strike rate. Has a really low uh, chase rate, though. Uh, only 20% of batters are chasing this pitch. So I was curious to see if anyone could guess why Gossman's slider isn't getting anyone to chase it. And this is where we have dead air <laughs> while we wait. Uh, I, I would, from what you're saying, all right, so we have Miles Nelson coming through in the clutch uh, because his slider isn't very good. Yeah. Okay. There's um. There's that. There's um, that. As a as a know, hypothesis, we can start from there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Miles. So, uh, it's not that you're really wrong, and I hate you or anything like that. No, okay. Um. Yeah. It's it's it's. I'm, let's actually head in the direction that Art uh TZ is throwing us in there. He throws it in hitters counts. Uh. And he's actually really close here, and I want to actually jump off in here. Well, if you're a hitter. And you're in hitter count and you're going to ignore it. Like, which is the ultimate hitter's count by that measure that you wouldn't swing at a pitch? Matt, you want to try to guess? Can you repeat the question, please? I was reading Miles next to the <laughs> comment. I'm sorry. I was just, this is not good for me. I'm not used to having the chat feature completely distract me while you're asking me questions. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was asking you, was like, which count do you think people are least likely to swing? Uh, I would say first pitch. Yeah. Kevin Gossman's slider is the slider in the league that had the highest usage like of all of its usage that was particular to the first pitch in other words 49.7 percent of the time if gossman threw a slider it was thrown as his first pitch of the back it is a sneak attack pitch if you will right people aren't expecting it okay, he's yeah. a two-pitch guy and then suddenly this thing that's going way slower than the rest of his arsenal drops in for a strike and this is the thing that really got me going on csw when i realized that as I went and tried to find other pitches that worked almost exactly the same way, 
some really weird stuff happened. So I went after I, I noticed this for this particular pitch, and I, I went on Savant and I pulled a search for like a bunch of different pitch types. So uh, for fastballs, it didn't really get me a whole lot, but for curveballs in particular, I found a ton of pitches that had much greater than 50% of their usage exclusive to the first pitch. Here's a couple of them. So the one that was the most crazy in this direction was Will Smith's curveball. 60% of its usage was an OO. This thing had a 40.5 CSW on a 32.2% called strike rate and just an 8.3% swinging strike rate. Wow. You can see maybe where this yeah. is going to go. <laughs> yes. We had a couple other ones that sat at about 57% uh, OO usage. Uh, Dylan Bundy's curveball. I do want to give Alex Fast credit for bringing up this pitch last year. In like the well, if you're going to gonna like... attack CSW, yeah. at least give Alex Fast some credit. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, he called out right? exactly how this is being used. Yeah. <laughs> it's mostly done in the first pitch. Had a 36.2% uh, CSW from 31% called strikes. Just a 4.8 swing strike rate on that pitch. No one's swinging at these things. Cobb, Alex Cobb has a knuckle curve. Yet another. We got three former Orioles in this list of four players already. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Alex Cobb has a knuckle curve. 36.4% CSW, 25.6 called strike. He's actually got some swinging strikes. Uh, Ryan Yarbrough Singer, 54% OO, 32.7 CSW, 28.9 called strike rate. And uh, Kershaw's four-seamer actually showed up in here as like the four-seamer that was most hmm. this way. 47% of the time, if he was throwing that pitch, it was an OO. Uh, and 23% called strike out of 30% CSW. So this... Th this can't be a coincidence then it's like obviously the thought right all of these pitches that are dramatically oo pitches have these gigantic csw numbers inflated by gigantic called strike numbers so like i i think we should kind of return does that make us think then that this slider he has is any good based off its csw alone and uh, I, I mean, it definitely yeah. calls into question whether or not it's effective or whether he's just catching people off guard with it, which also, right, might explain what you were talking about before, which is why it's it doesn't have a, such a low chase rate because people are watching it on strike one. Right. And then it's not fooling them later in the count. So they're not they're not chasing it outside the zone. Right. Well, I mean, well, is there even a later in the count for this thing? Well, me. Of, right. Me, yeah, is he yeah. even throwing it then? I suppose that's fair, too. Yeah, so I, I personally would be really interested to see what Toronto will do with Gossman. You know, Manoa's got a really fantastic slider. Uh, he throws his slider almost exclusively not on the first pitch. So, you know, who, who knows what's going on there? But it would be interesting for me to see if that changes with a new pitching staff. That actually, relatively speaking, guess I do have to trust. Like, they did some really good things with Robbie Ray. Manoa was successful immediately. They've had... a you know, a handful of guys make some substantial changes and seem like they were better for it. So, you know, if we're going in the direction of should so-and-so make some changes based off of uh, here's a number off of a pitch he never throws, could he become a three-pitch guy? Um, I think that, you know, there are some intangible qualities there that make me interested. But as we're going to get to in just a second, um, I actually found when I dug in, that the 36 or so percent CSW that he would have had would have actually been below average for the first pitch of account. And what mm. that told me then is that we really, if we're going to be trying to pay attention to like pitch specific stuff, have to take into account usage pretty heavily to understand whether a pitch is actually good based off of its swinging strike and uh, called strike numbers. If a pitch is primarily being used in no strike counts is what I actually found. I pulled it for every single count, both uh, the CSW and the called strike and then swinging strike numbers to split it all out. And it was just incredible how this broke out. So with no strikes, um, the average CSW was 37.5. With no strikes, batters took 28.7% of the time and they, uh, they whiffed 8.8% .8 of the time. Uh, so if you, you know, the early pitches are going to just look really good. Um, the CSW for one strike in total was 25.6, the 11% called strike rate and 13.8. You can see people are swinging more, taking less, and those are swinging back into, a, into balance a bit, but the total CSW drops considerably. And then with two strikes, it was a 20% average CSW, just 4.6% of all mm. two strike counts ended in a called strike. 
uh, 15.4% swinging strike rate. So you can see the out pitches people are throwing need to be doing better than 15% yeah. in order to actually be effective in those cases. And, you know, you can't and they need to be with pitches. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and that's like, it. that's not surprising in its own way, right? You talked about earlier <laughs> right. about the yeah. eye test. And it's always fun to me when baseball is kind of exactly what we'd expect. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, we go looking, we go looking and we come back and, you know, we find it staring at us in these sorts of ways. So I want, uh, I want to ask you then. So like, mm -hmm. uh, how do you, we, we've talked about this, like for um, pitches in particular, there are some guys who like basically have a couple pitches that only exist in like, oh, counts. So like that, can you think of anyone that like does that like as an entire pitcher then like is that like that's kind of like the thought that's kind of like driving me here so i, I guess i'm asking him but i'm not really asking <laughs> yeah <Right>. i, I, I <laughs> you're you're looking for a name of, of like no. a person i know i know i'm this? fishing here in a, in a pond that is that is not going to lead to a whole lot uh because yeah, i, I, I asked this in a pretty awful way <laughs> you can totally just just say what you want you don't have to make it seem as though you're giving me a chance here that's totally fine. <laughs> uh, one thing that I did that did pop into my head that I would be curious about too is, uh, and I know that some of this the the data has started to come out, like on Twitter, you see like like the umpire scorecard. I wonder how if there's a, a difference between how likely an umpire is to call a strike on an OO count versus a two strike count. I wonder if there's anything going on there too. That's just a curiosity that came up as you're talking. So maybe that's like phase two. That is um, that is an interesting uh, concept there, there, and I'm sure we actually could figure that out. Not right uh, now, but I'm not going to. <laughs> as we listen to some mouse clicks in the background, just saying yeah. for those of you who might be playing a game at home. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, where this goes and where this kind of like impacts CSW is as well is that if you as a pitcher are not throwing a whole lot of two strike pitches because your entire approach is to never let the batter get that far into the count. If you're yeah. pitching to contact earlier, you're living in that 37% CSW life quite a bit of the time. And you are not living in that 20% CSW life. Uh, and as I went and tried to figure out like who CSW is going to be wrong to us about after kind of like this pitch kind of messed with my head and other pitches like this messed with my head. I want to give credit uh, where credits to Mikey Ahedo's piece on Brady Singer that he launched last year was a thing that really got me going on this like originally. And I kind of connected the dots back together more recently. Uh, basically the, the conclusion he came to for singer is that he's like a, this is a 2020 singer. I think is it, he was like a 90% CSW guy, like in terms, like, in terms of like 90th percentile. And then his strikeouts just didn't follow at all. He, he mm -hmm. couldn't strike anybody out. And the answer is pretty simple. He had a, a, a sinker that he threw for called strikes really effectively. Like, and he did not out pitch. And yeah. um, as a result, his PAs ended really quickly. Um, and the effects of that were pretty obvious. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, Brady Singer dramatically underperformed what that one stat would tell us about who he is and like what, you know, what we should expect of him going forward. But, and I think this is the thing that was like really interesting is Brady Singer did this in his rookie year and was a shortened season as well. We didn't have a good picture, picture of, a good picture of who he is as a pitcher. Ugh, a good pitcher picture. Uh, don't don't do that to me. I won't do that to you either. <laughs> and as a result, like what really got going for me is like there. It does seem like there's a path for CSW to break. If you yeah. aren't throwing that many pitches in account, you're going to have an on average inflated total number, and you're going to you're going to be a Toby. Mm. The other side of things is where things get really curious. If you're someone who throws a lot of pitches in account, who are you? You might be walking guys. Uh, and I do want to admit that. Yeah. Me, but that's not right. going to show up necessarily in <laughs> some other things. But like, you're also going to be throwing more out pitches in like these two accounts where people are not going to be, um, you know, letting it just go past. And what that kind of led to is like, I went back into some like old box scores or I guess they'd be like the, the daily write-ups, like the, the SP roundups, those are there, the Nick had done. Mm -hmm. And I, I went back and found a couple instances where someone had a fantastic day, you know, like 15, 16 whiffs and had like a 31, 32% uh, like CSW on the day. Uh, and you know, you'd find someone on the same day, like John Gray had like a 38% CSW with like two strikeouts and like allowed three earned runs. And 
obviously that's like one day's worth of data but like those one dates don't happen in isolation uh mm -hmm. and so we care about csw for a couple of really important reasons and i want to make sure as i like say some mean things that i <laughs> qualify the mean things with a i'm only really worried about how it breaks insofar as i think it's fixable and i think it's worth fixing the idea that uh the number of called and ringing strikes you earn you like earned strikes if you want to just call it like the number of strikes you're earning is important and you should get more of them is seems like a pretty important and simple idea um and you want to credit people for earning any sorts of strikes they're getting just because it might be harder to get some uh called strikes in certain situations and easier in others doesn't mean that they're not still important to getting people out right um right. what's the problem though is if it's breaking along a particular line we've run into a particular type of problem that basically makes CSW hard for any sort of modeling issues. Um, I didn't pay that much attention to econometrics and I've tried to go back and relearn some of it. I didn't do a very good job, but I didn't get back <laughs> either. Uh, but, you know, econometrics statistics classes basically have these like sort of assumptions you have to make whenever you're like modeling things. And that kind of generally also holds when you're not actually doing modeling stuff on a computer. And so it's kind of just like, oh, he's good at that thing. More of that thing, please. He good, whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you want to make sure that like... <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> brain broke up here. Okay, yeah. uh, you know they're, they're, these assumptions you make are important, <laughs> and one of them is that like um, you know you can't have like one edge be more wrong than the other. In, in this case, like the ways that CSW are is going to be wrong are correlated with the number of pitches that a pitcher throws in an average at bat. That breaks a bunch of assumptions that we make about like linear models and like typing out correlations and stuff like that, and says. And like basically, if you find that happening, you have to you should stop and investigate the source of that and try to fix it instead of saying, eh, whatever, number go up. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's one of the OLS assumptions uh, about heteroscedicity, uh, I believe. Ooh. Yeah. I, I okay. Don't I'll, I'm going to take your word for that one. <laughs> um, and so like, it's our job then to go out and fix it. Uh, and no, I, I, I that's, the, question that's kind of the well, that's the question that I, I was starting to, to formulate in my mind. Like it begs the question or a couple of questions. One, how can we use this information in actionable ways? So like which guys maybe look a little bit better and stronger than they they may actually be in terms of the correlation between that number and the categories that matter in fantasy? Um, and how do we quote unquote fix CSW so that it is maybe a little bit more reliable for what we're trying to use it for in, in those circumstances. Well, you, you know how I like to fix things, right? How do I fix uh, every yeah. stab? <laughs> yeah. I throw it over plate appearances. <laughs> and how how would you how would you describe that? If so, you throw it over um, plate appearances. Yeah. Like what would so the, what I, would that be called? Um, <laughs> I guess if you were really awful like me, you could hastily call that CSW per PA. Um, I would rather call something like, I don't know, like earn strike average is probably a way that I would try to describe that to like someone who's not making fun of me by playing bingo. Uh, you know, it's like the <laughs> average number of strikes you're earning against the, against Wait, the batter. I'm not making fun of you. I was just trying to, to lead you into a place so that the people who are playing at home could have a little bit more fun. I, I I really am not trying to make fun of you, Alexander. I want to make that clear. That's kind. I was making fun of me, so it's okay. Okay. Well, you're allowed <laughs> to make fun of you. I don't. I don't want to be the one making fun. Anyway, so s seriously, in terms of like how we use this, if we are going with CSW per PA, which is definitely like your thing, right? Is to is to break it down in well, and, and again, I'm, I'm not like teasing, but like really, be, and there's a reason for that. So maybe like describe the reason for why per PA is uh, what it does for us and how it's actionable and useful in terms of analyzing this information when we're looking at it. So I, I talk a lot about the different fractions that our stats are made of because it seems like we always make the same few th mistakes. And so I don't have to like be creative to come up with new solutions because <laughs> you can solve the same problems the same ways. The problem with leaving pitches in the denominator, so CSW as a fraction of like or the, the amount of pitch pitches you throw is the number of pitches that you throw is an indication of some sort of skill. And you got to keep skill out of the denominator wherever you can. Um, so basically, the people who throw fewer pitches are, you know, the people who maybe you can assume can't get a batter later into the count. 
no, it, it might also be in some cases a matter of people who throw too many pitches because they have terrible command. So one way or another mm -hmm. has different ways it can break in terms of skill. That's a problem. Plate appearances, batter's face, same thing. That basically can't indicate the sort of skill in terms of capacity to strike people out and get people out. Now, yes, I just want to say, you know, the number of PAs you get as a batter or batters you get to face as a pitcher that has some indication to skill, but the top moves in the same way. If you're good, you, the top should go up when the bottom goes up kind of in tandem. So it, it's not an issue. A mm -hmm. As a result, if you're looking at CSW per PA, you can think, okay, someone who can earn 1.3 or so strikes against the average batter instead of like one, which is like pretty low is getting more like getting closer to striking them out. Um, whereas if you get an earned strike in like 33% of your pitches, that doesn't necessarily mean the same thing if you're averaging three pitches against the average batter versus four. Um, and th that's basically the big problem. Um, so if you move to this sort of thing, the benefits are actually really tangible. Uh, and this is the thing that really shocked me is like, okay, I know there's a place where along the edge things are breaking. So let's go test how it performs in predicting and correlating to strikeouts. I did those kind of separately. And what I found is that CSW per PA beats CSW in like a pretty substantial and an obvious way. Like if we're, we're saying it's, there's like 25% less like noise is basically the way that I would say it. So like, um, for example, I took like all of the pitchers who threw, uh, I faced at least 200 batters last year because 200 is like the stat cast slider percentile uh, bar. And among that group, for example, the correlation between CSW rate and CSW per PA in strikeout rate uh, was a little bit better. Let me grab that exact number because I thought it was worth having. Uh, oh no, I deleted them. If I remember though, it was about oh, no. 0.83 and 0.86 <laughs> or so. Pretty okay. good. Um, Maybe it's no, actually, I think it was a little better than the 0.86. Uh, those numbers aren't all that important. I'll post them later whenever I read yes, them. Yes, yes, um, I was just going to suggest okay. that. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw that on my Twitter. And, uh, but the, the point there, though, is like that's just that that bar. I, I'd previously done them earlier with like a, a smaller uh, sample of total people, like earlier in the season. I remember it for a couple months. And what I found is that the uh, the correlation, this is, I think I did this, uh, I remember I've been sitting on this for a while, actually. So yeah, I, I did I this. In, yeah, I did this in roughly like uh, the in in June or so, and then you know like every, everything fell off a cliff because of the sticky stuff. At, at June mm -hmm. or so, the correlation between um, CSW rate was about 0. 0.6 to strikeout rate, and CSW per PA we were talking about 0. 0.7. Uh, so that's pretty, this was a lot better. Mm -hmm. The thing that really shocked me though is that as I was going through this, I also is like, okay, let's test how this is for call strike rate and swinging strike rate and then it's like okay i fixed with pa let's do called strikes per pa and swinging strikes per pa and see what happens swinging strikes per pa did better than C like csw per pa and that oh, blew me away wow. uh but, like let's put that back into some human terms if you will the yeah. number of whiffs you get against the average batter did a better job of predicting the number of strikeouts that you're going to have going forward than the total of whiffs and called strikes in other words, having all earned strikes as the thing that you look at added noise and made it harder to figure out how many people you're going to strike out going forward because it was better to have, you know, six whiffs per 10 batters and four called strikes than it is to have five and five. Um, mm -hmm. The more like whiffs you have, the better. So, you know, think back to like the sort of like uh, stuff that like Nick's doing with uh you know like the roundups and you're talking about like the number of people who are going to like lead the gallows pole for him you know he's <laughs> tracking individual whiffs like those things matter more and of course they do i actually have talked to him a bit about this and he's like basically like yeah of course swinging strikes matter more for strikeouts duh it's just that and this is the idea is that csw matched better to some of the outcome based things so what i did to test this this is what i spent my day on is i pulled all of the data for every pitcher who appeared in july and August. And this is really back in the napkin, but it, it worked enough for me to think that it's worth going into later. And what I did is I, I lined up everyone's CSW rate, CSW per PA, swing strike rate, right strike per PA, a bunch of other stuff. And I also, because I'm, you know, 
me i also grabbed like their hard hit and like soft contact is data because i'm like oh i'll check that later i want to like waste the opportunity to do this and what i found was really fun um so i'm gonna do this for a couple different things uh so first i did it for like literally everybody so this includes like the position players who like but appeared both in july and august and like the relievers who are like in mop up duty have been sent back and up and down from the minors everybody is so i compared how well these numbers correlated with themselves from one month to the next strikeout rate one month to the next like next month's era and next month's uh fip i felt fip was a fair one i didn't want to like grab sierra because it takes a little while and it was mm, it's gonna be a mess and what i found is that swinging strike per pa um was by far like almost twice as good as csw rate in terms of sticking to itself in the next month now these are guys who are pitching like one or two starts in a month it's like twice as good if the whole goal of csw rate is to like be good quickly like swinging strike rate, rate per pa you know like whiffs per batter if you will like um like stuck to itself faster and then stuck to decay rate now here's the crazy thing it was better at predicting next month's strikeout rate than strikeout rate was. So if you want to figure out who's going <laughs> well, to be good, yeah, that just looking at the whiffs make makes sense. sense. Yeah. yeah, it does make sense. My, so here are a couple of things I'm thinking. And again, this is coming from my angle, which is, so this might be completely stupid and you can go ahead and tell me that it's completely stupid. If you, we, we said off the top that called strikes can be a skill uh, at times, depending upon certain people, right? And and we see Nick throwing some names in, in the chat there in terms of like people who get hurt in different ways, right? And, and there's always those players at the at the edges. Would something like, and, and again, stay with me here for just a second, and then you can tell me how dumb I am. That's totally fine. Um, something like a, a weighted CSW where you, so because if called strikes matter, but they matter less, is there a way to weight whiffs uh or or swinging strikes more than called strikes but still incorporate called strikes and get a similar correlation that you've seen there does that sound like something that may i'm sure it could be make some yeah. sense no like that that makes sense in concept like i mean that's what basically every era estimator is doing is it saying that okay. strikeouts matter more than walks and matter a whole lot more than insert hard hit sure, whatever right, right. or like home runs or barrels whatever you want like yes yeah, so you can probably do like an expected uh strikeout rate and i would probably want to build it around things like per batter whiffs and called strikes and, and i would imagine if you ran that regression blah 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 you're gonna find that whiffs are the thing that matter most you're absolutely right on that uh called strikes by the way like called strike rate in isolation had like basically no use uh and uh <laughs> it was not basically no use but like it, it really struggled to stand out sure. um now i do want to say if you, i want to respond directly to something that nick brought up because this is what surprised me as well is when we look at the the batters who kind of like suffer most he brought up two names uh one of which is really interesting to me is zach wheeler zach wheeler is actually someone who it has csw rate under predict his or probably um yeah, under predicts his strikeout rate, I think. Um, he strikes out more people than his CSW rate would suggest, actually. He's joined by guys like, and I have a list of them here, Pablo Lopez, Lance Lynn, and Zach Gallen are all big standouts there. The people who are at the, and those are people at the farthest edge who moves right. by, move by 20 percentile or more, as in their strikeout percentile, it would be like somewhere around 85, and their CSW percentile would be around 60. They are much mm. better in terms of strikeout yeah, rate. Yeah, than yeah. So we're using suggest. percentiles and not, yeah, yeah, yeah gotcha. And then, yeah, and so Zach Wheeler is one of the ones people who moves more than 20 percentiles. The people who are on the other far end who move most in the other direction are all the classic Tobies that we kind of want to avoid. <laughs> so, you know, you get people like uh, Kyle Hendricks, Wainwright, Mad Bum, Ryan Yarborough, Dylan Bundy, Jose Urquidy, Marcus Stroman. Those are all on the edges. What matters here then is like if CSW is most broken for the people we want to know most about, that's an issue. What I found though is that CSW per PA still does a really good job pretty quickly at predicting future strikeout rate. And it beats some of the other things in predicting FIP and ERA, especially once I raise the bar for number of uh, like 
pitches that you had over the course of a month. So when I got to like the 100 or 200 or 300 pitches in a month, you really saw CSW PA and also CSW rates start to catch up to the swinging strike and then eventually kind of surpass it in some sort of ways. So what that would tell me is that if you think these tools are important, you're right. We're not talking about gigantic differences here. Like when I just look at the all correlation, it's like, it's a lot of people who don't matter. <laughs> Once you start getting into the actual <laughs> starting pitch or starting pitch or month to month correlations, yeah, um, you do want to care about like whiffs per batter sort of stuff. It is going to be, and like you want to care about CSW because it's going to help you predict strikeout rates better than strikeout rate. That's important. Um, like we're talking about in, like once you start using these things of like larger than like half a start samples, we're talking mm -hmm. about things that are similar to like the difference between like WOBA and OPS. Like well, OPS isn't perfect, but it's not that wrong. And like, if you know what one of them means and you're like, I know when it's going to break a little bit, you're going to be fine. I think the thing we just have to be wary of as kind of like a content producing hive or whatever that we are, is that not everybody's looking in all of the right spots. You know, we're not Tom Cruise and Edge of Tomorrow knowing to, to turn our back around because CSW is going to be like a Toby sort of thing or whether the large alien's going to chop our head off. I don't know. Great movie, by the way. Y'all should go watch Edge of Tomorrow. Um, yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> clearly you're selling it i just I, I mean we're close here to the to the end of our time and i want to see if there's a way that we can maybe uh flesh this out because we are entering now into the beginning of when people are going to start draft prep if they have not already um mm -hmm. some people are already drafting obviously but it's going to start to pick up significantly so people who are trying to get the edge right they're they're in a competitive league and they're trying to get the edge by listening to us and hearing you talk about this what are the tldr action steps that somebody can take as they're looking at these numbers where where would you direct them to go first to try and find those values at the edges or a way to just kind of be a little bit more informed than their league mates when they're 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 drafting so I would say a couple of things. First and foremost, you probably want to also care about things like pitching plus and stuff plus and command plus that are like the outcomes independent. How much does the pitch move and how well can someone place it there? Things more in light of this, because it does reveal that a lot of the outcomes based stuff that you might care about is going to be highly developed on usage. Or I will say at the other end of things, though, you know that those numbers can lie because people can tip their pitches and pitches don't well work well tunneling with each other. So it's like, if you want to use these things yeah. together, that's kind of like the thing you should probably be looking for. Um, all of our numbers are going to be wrong. It's not our job to stop using them and think that statistics are for liars. It's our job to be aware <laughs> of how they lie to us and being able to make up for it. <laughs> Cause like people make choices people are the problem kind of uh, <laughs> well, so if you want to I mean, you know, that's a no, that's a pretty that. big statement yeah that's yeah, largely yeah. It's true in a lot of ways that <laughs> it's that's not specific to baseball <laughs> yeah. um yeah so what i would want to do though is like you're going to care about these numbers most in small samples relievers rookie pitchers people who maybe made a significant change late in the year or had an injury right if that's the case what I would encourage you to do is, and it's really easy to pull the stuff yourself. I promise you can go to a savant search and you can change your dates. If you want to do any of that in order to get CSW, you go to like pitch outcome and you can click called strikes. And then like all the swing and whiff, there's about five things. And then you can go down to the bottom and you can change your total pitches to say like plate appearances. And when you hit search, that will give you back CSW per PA. If you want to click out the called strikes, you can get your like whiffs per PA marks mm -hmm. and then you can sort those over different samples and stuff like that to find people that seem like they're excelling in some different cir circumstances i promise you a lot of these things are a lot easier than you think they might be to pull yourself and if you have questions i respond to my dms about this all the time i have plenty mm -hmm. of people asking me questions about how to pull this sort of data and a bunch of other stuff as well um, me i ask all the time <laughs> yeah. the thing that i found most a lot of the guys who are way up at these leaderboards are a lot of relievers that um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of excited about. So it's fun, for example, to shout out my boy Mikey again, Paul Seawall. It's just like super elite mm -hmm. and excellent and all these different marks on the per PA basis <laughs> and improves. Um, so yeah, we're all Paul Seawald fans. Um, and uh, I, I just encourage you, it's like you're going to be able to find a lot of different outliers and people that stand out. Um, and it's your job then to try, try to find that other thing that's kind of weird about them where, you know, if that's say... 
uh, that someone's just like walking everybody or hitting everybody. I, I had Austin Adams ruined a pro, uh, ruined the model I was doing for <laughs> soft contact because he's like he was mm. hard contacting it's the always ruining you know. everything. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, I I wonder if and and this was not cleared. So we'll see we'll see uh, if he's willing. But I think since we just spent fifty five minutes talking about CSW. We should have Nick come back on for these last five minutes. He's listening. I know he's there and and maybe respond to what, what he up? thinks about mm. all of this as we okay. see Kat make an appearance. I mean, I think this is great. Uh, the one the one thing that uh, I've been kind of wrestling with a lot this past year um, and why I've been I, I, Alex, I really want to see you dive into strike rate on stuff and kind of see that correlate with, uh, um, you know, uh, like say like hard contact, soft contact and really get a good sense of like, yeah, the best pitchers obviously would have a high strike rate and induce weak contact too, that they can throw strikes and then not get burned by it. Right. Um, and so, so when it comes to high CSW rate and like the show me pitches, right? Exactly. It's a show me pitch. It's early in the count. Like that is not the best use of CSW stuff. Um, it's a good explanation of like, yeah, wait, he only throws it a certain amount of time. You got to do a little bit more digging and just saying, oh, no, it's a great pitch. It's a high CSW, right? Understand what makes it up. Is it high on the swing strike area? Is it high on the, the called strike area? Great example, too, is Patrick Sandoval's changeup. It's a high CSW pitch, but it's a 29% swing strike rate, and he doesn't throw in the zone, so he needs a complement to it. He needs something mm -hmm. he can throw for strikes in that arsenal, right? But it's still that is a high strikeout pitch. The one thing I brought up with Wheeler and Alcantara that I'm really curious about here is you know essentially whiffs per plate appearance well let's say you throw like 10 you're so inefficient that you need 10 pitches to get them out you're going to get more whiffs in, in the course of that at bat more likely than than say like wheeler alcantara who do get quick outs right well, because I mean, they, they are really good at doing that that's why they go deeper into games often and the thing yes, i like about whiffs to kind of like yeah. pull off the 10 pitch thing really quickly yeah. is you can still you only get three, a couple of them. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, right. and that's the a, fair thing. It's just thing. a higher likelihood because you're throwing more pitches to get to it um, is all I'm getting at. Like at bats, like, I'm trying to figure out the right way to properly weight pitchers who are do, do a good job of getting early outs, mm -hmm. right? Because well, especially these, those, those are the guys that are able to do that, and Dylan Cease has gone after five innings or so because yeah, he's yeah, inefficient, yeah. but he'll probably have a high whiff per PA. So, you know, okay, so he's going to get a whiff and then he he's going to bounce too and he's going to get a whiff and it's just, that's not necessarily always great. So yeah. there's a balance yeah. to be had here. Well, and if you're getting the first pitch of a count as a strike, so you're getting the get me over pitch, the the expected, like, well, I, th I think it was, well, but it was a, an article by Ben Clemens from a few years back. It, it goes way, way down. Oh, yeah. So right. it, it's way more likely that that batter, after watching a pitch get called a strike, is going to not perform very well in that at bat. So that and, and if you throw on top of that the talent of the pitcher, right? It makes sense that somebody like that wouldn't be going as deep into the at bat. Yes, Alex. So uh, there is I think a way to kind of like look at this as let's figure out how good someone is and then we can weight that against like average strikeouts you would get or whatever. You can basically figure out someone's going to have 0.1 more strikeouts per whatever and then kind of weight that against how long they're going to go to figure you know for fantasy purposes right. you know it's like a way i like to look at it is that um you know degrom is going to strike out more batters and also go longer and you can multiply those against each other for fantasy purposes or whatever the thing that i think this is most interesting for is not degrom though we know he's good. We want to mm -hmm. be able to use stuff like this to more reliably figure out how good Grayson Rodriguez is going to be in the, his first couple of months in the majors. Sure, yeah. like, that's the thing we care about. Not the people who like, we know who Marcus Stroman is like, that's definitely not our use case. It's just important to see them showing up on the edges of things to tell us it's someone could be really good or they could be Marcus Stroman. We need to know more. Right. Yeah, well, I'm glad well, we, he's you know, good, but you, you know, uh, you know what I mean. Maybe. I remember when he's you really DM good at striking about, uh, about Gaussman slider. I'm like, yeah, what about it? It's like it's kind of bad, <laughs> but he gets like strikes with it in times and stuff, and that's that's all it is. It's like, oh, it's got 35 percent CSW, and I guess my initial reaction was like, yeah, uh, because like he's not, you know, um, I mean, I guess I'll put it this way: you make a really good point. It's like, right, you th you would think from that, uh, but I think a lot of people, anyone you know, familiar with Gaussman's like, well, yeah, but that's not. He's never going to turn to that in two strikes. We, and then like right in the data, it will say early strike. And actually, we have an approach tab. It's a cool thing. I like. I have all these terms, 
a lock and high lock and early percentage and stuff like that that doesn't you're not going to find on fan graphs and savant and stuff but i was like i think this is kind of cool to quickly see uh and of course that's still you know it's going to even be better um in the next year as we have a better strike uh representation strikes and representation than we currently do uh which is really cool but uh but yeah definitely be using that um and i, I think we currently have it so like early percentages what percentage of this pitch like when he throws a slider how often is it early middle or late essentially um, how do you it might define be kind early? of interesting to see the other way of just relative to all of his other pitches like this slider makes up 30 percent of his early pitches as opposed to the, the pitch itself but it's kind of hard yeah. to get into all the tables for that stuff so yeah, we just have like, it as that one early rate sounds to me like just like no strike rate is it's, that it's what like, like, like percentage of usage is... with no strikes yeah it's um oh oh one oh and oh one i, I okay yeah, um yeah. and then uh and then late is anything with two strikes on it um and then behind is the other one so okay. it's two oh two one three one and three oh okay yeah whenever i was like charting all of the different csws and like chase rates and stuff like that yeah. by counts earlier today that sounds about right to like how i would try to draw things up so good what you're talking about structured <laughs> yeah yeah so when you're talking about early rates you know those are going to be you know a sign then that a pitch is called strike rate is going to be inflated potentially csw rate would be inflated and right. swinging strike rate would be deflated which is like kind of just like, you know, I'm only bringing up Gossman slider to kind of like intro the idea that other things can be broken around the edges. I don't think that you or anyone else are going to make the argument that he needs to be throwing in more. Uh, no. And I think that's why it's such a perfect pitch is that I don't feel like I'm dunking on anyone right. other well, than I mean, like Bundy, my imaginary self. Bundy lost that curveball. Exactly. Um, and Alex Cobb, I think you mentioned him too. Very important to have those curveballs for called strikes. Um, absolutely. And yeah, it's a, uh, it's something we're aware of that like oh, it'll be really cool to kind of have like the average understanding what the average is for a slider early in counts and say oh this is the different one you know that's something you know that i think would be pretty cool um uh wink wink nudge nudge no i'm just joking <laughs> uh, but i uh, but anyway um i need to kick you off now so if you, yeah. have a, you have an outro you want to do for your podcast now is the time uh, I we will take care of that for later on. Oh, I see. Uh, that's all on the, post stuff. It's, oh, great! So do, I can just yes. boot you out. There's a lot oh, of post wonderful. stuff before you boot me out, though. Yes. Please, oh, just a reminder to all of those who played bingo: go ahead and email me if you're a winner at uh, dugoutstudyhall at gmail.com. We're going to figure out a winner, and we're going to make another donation to a very worthy cause. Uh, if you are not the winner, please make a donation on your own. This is uh, it's an amazing event, Nick. Thank you for having us be a part of it. It's really very special. It's uh, it's an honor to be included in all of this. So thank you, and to th thanks to everybody listening and uh, contributing. Well, no, yeah. thank you guys, Alex. Oh, I was just gonna say you would know that we do our intro and post if you'd ever been a guest on our podcast. Well, I didn't know if you wanted to do it now or not. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we're good. I'll take care of it later on. And, uh, and yeah. yeah, I would, I would absolutely adore being a guest on your podcast. Yes, it's um, it is on the to do again? list. I promise. I think I have once. Mm -hmm. I think, no, I think no, that's if a you're look counting like, no. this, if you're counting this, then yes. <laughs> oh no, no, fast went on. That was what I'm thinking. <laughs> fast of. did come on. Um, yeah. All right, wow, you invited fast before me. How insulting! No, I am joking completely. This was awesome, guys. <laughs> a fantastic discussion. I think a really good glimpse into that. You guys, anyone can listen to Duck Out Study Hall. At the very evergreen too, because um, mm. a lot of the concepts you guys talk about are still around today. Um, so definitely go we check try. Out the yeah, we're, we're trying to help people better understand things. And we don't we do, will use people in the moment as case studies, but it doesn't make the concept any less true. So uh, if you want to go back and look at the library, absolutely. There's lots of stuff. And we've had lots of amazing guests throughout our episodes as well, who bring a lot of new perspectives. And we're going to have some amazing guests coming on too well, well, I'm gonna in the future. Down, so, uh... <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I got to go. We got to move on here. So thank you guys yep. so much. Uh, and we'll talk soon. Adios.